Okay, good afternoon. We'll go on with our discussion of the <coughs> WKB method. Uh, the WKB method or WKB approximation. We looked at the uh, problem uh, of a slowly changing uh, potential. So if I have some potential in some region of space, okay, so suppose this is the x-axis and this is our v of x. And we are looking at the possible value of a solution at a certain energy level E. Okay, and our result, okay, so last time we mainly looked at the case when E uh, was greater than V, so that we have some amount of uh, kinetic energy here, and it's equal to P squared over 2M, where by P uh, we mean the classical uh, momentum. Okay, so in that case, we found out that we can find solutions, approximate solutions, uh, which have the form 1 over square root of p, where, okay, so let me write that out explicitly, uh, p is equal to uh, square root of 2me or h bar. No, just no h bar, right? square root of 2m e minus v. Okay, so e minus v is the kinetic energy. So uh, 2m times kinetic energy square root is uh, the p. So we had <coughs> some sort of uh, constant which needs to be, the function needs to be, we have to discuss the normalization separately. Uh, but <coughs> we had e to the plus or minus i, okay, 1 over h bar times the uh, integral of this function p, p of x, because v is changing as a function of x, so let me call it p of x prime dx prime, okay, and I integrate it, so uh, I can integrate from some point to x, from x to some other point, okay, integral uh, which involves uh, the x position. Okay, so, uh, and this is good uh, when I have the magnitude of this, uh, e minus v is large, or in some sense the momentum is large. Okay, so that's what we had now. Uh, we have not discussed what happens in the region where V is larger than E, okay? But you can sort of guess what happens in quantum mechanics, okay? So over here now we have some region in which V is larger than E, and we are going to define a variable, again, P, just the analytic continuation of the that we have here to the right hand side. So we are going to call it p bar and that's going to be equal to square root of 2mv minus e. Okay, so remember when we are solving these problems which involve uh, places where particle is, has some kinetic energy, <coughs> then we had these sinusoidals. And in case we have uh, v greater than e, then we had these exponentials that decayed or increased. Okay, so the case for e less than v, uh, we are just going to extend this uh, analysis, okay? And the form of the wave function is going to be <coughs> square root of p bar e to the uh, plus or minus 1 over h bar, integral x, okay, this p bar, x prime, dx prime. 
Okay, so what we have done is just uh, expressed the solutions. You see, uh, I am just skipping over some mathematics here. Uh, why? Because remember that uh, when we uh, derived this equation, we wrote down the Schrodinger equation in a form where we said the wave function was going to have a magnitude and a phase, okay, and separated the imaginary and real parts, obtained a, an equation for the real part, an equation for the imaginary part, and then through that we obtain that, okay, that argument doesn't go through for this function, right? This is all real. So it doesn't have an imaginary part uh, in such things, but it's just uh, in some sense in the analytical uh, continuation that works on the other side. So if you just look at how these things behave, uh, so if you <laughs> just look at the case uh, when I have a constant <coughs> v, okay, so if I have some constant v0 here and uh, this energy level e over there, then <coughs> the uh, wave function has the form 1 over square root of p, which is just a constant, but then uh, over uh, as the phase, I'm going to get, okay, 1 over h bar times integral of p of x, which is just this square root of 2m uh, e minus v, okay, uh, <coughs> times x. And this is precisely what we called, okay, k, okay, the wave number for a wave with energy E in this potential V0. Okay, so if I have these flat potentials like this, then things become uh, exact. Okay, so that's what we have, so that's not surprising, but if you go to the other case, okay, so suppose I am now looking at the, okay, so now the particles inside this tunneling region or whatever, uh, so that the potential now is, let's call it V1, is, the, is larger than the energy E, then the solutions are going to be 1 over square root of P bar, again, just for normalization purposes, and then I'm going to get E to the plus or minus 1 over h bar, and then, okay, our new uh, p, which is going to be, okay, just a constant, so 2m v1 minus e now, okay, times x. So this is the uh, e to the plus or minus kx type of, okay, linear combinations that we had when the potential was higher than the energy of the particle. And this is this k is actually precisely equal to that. Okay, so for uh, just to develop some intuition, uh, these are uh, the uh, just the integral of this uh, classical momentum uh, as a function of x. If v is changing as a function of x, then v do the integral. Okay, so that's the content in the approximate uh, waveform in the WKB method. Okay, let's uh, do another example. Okay, so this, again, is just looking at this, you see I have these things in the denominator, P and P bar. These solutions, okay, these things fail, uh, okay, uh, when uh, E is near the potential because the uh, coefficient diverges. Uh, so we have to look at that case separately. Okay, uh, so as an example, uh, let me just uh, do the example in your textbook. Uh, the, uh, we'll look at uh, the uh, tunneling barrier. Uh, maybe I should put something like sharp here. Okay, you see, we cannot have 
v approximately equal to e at any point. So uh, I somehow have to skip that point. Okay, so uh, here now I'm going to get a potential which looks like this. Okay, so some general v of x and then x again. So this is now my potential v of x. Okay, some value here between 0 and x equal to a. Otherwise, the potential is equal to 0. Okay, so I have this sharp potential which e enables me to actually uh, find what will happen when I have a certain energy level E which is not equal to the V, okay, which is not near V as I uh, move along the x-axis. Okay, so what do I get for solutions here? Well, over here, okay, I know what the solutions are going to be. I'm going to get an A e to the i k x for particle flux moving in the plus, plus x direction. And then I'm going to also have a minus plus b e to the minus i k x. Okay, that corresponds to particles that have been reflected from the barrier. <laughs> On the right hand side, Okay, I'll have particles only moving towards the right. Okay, so I'm not sending any particles from the right. So I'll have a flux only towards the, the right. Okay, so uh, what about in the middle? Now in the middle, I'm going to get, <coughs> okay, solutions of this form because now I have a general V of X there. Okay, so in the middle, I'm going to have something which looks like C, okay, uh, over uh, square root of, uh, well, let me put it anyway, uh, P bar, uh, and then uh, E to the plus uh, one over H, okay, let me open up some space, okay, so let me write this zero to X, and I have here this p bar of x prime dx prime. But I also, in principle, have uh, d, okay, root p bar again, uh, e to the minus uh, 1 over h bar uh, 0 to x uh, p bar of x prime dx prime. Okay, so that's what I have in the middle. And to the right, on this side, I'm going to have e, e to the i kx. Right, so that's how I would write it. Now, I somehow need to match these uh, functions to the left and to the right. Okay, so at this point, we are going to make an approximation. We are going to look at the more general case a little bit later, but still, again, I'm not going to solve the full problem. Remember that solving this full problem, even for the straight barrier, uh, involves some bit of algebra, ugly algebra. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, do a full job with this, but... Uh, We'll just make certain uh, assumptions, approximations, so that we get the fundamental result. Okay, so we are going to uh, look at the limit of a thick uh, and high barrier. Okay, so that means the barrier is going to be high here, and it's also going to be thick. Now, what does that mean? I have a nice thick barrier, and the energy is below that value. In fact, I am interested in cases where E minus V is large. So that means there will be very little transmission. Okay, so this will lead to, okay, a small amount of 
transmission. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of these quantities? It means I'm going to get a small value for E. Okay, so uh, the value for E is going to be small. Now, so what does that mean in terms of uh, these uh, functions and how they influence this thing? Okay, first of all, you see that if I have a thick and high barrier, it means this P bar is large, right? Because P bar is equal to 2mv minus e and v minus e is large. So <clears throat> this thick means, okay, I have a, okay, large A, so that's the thickness of the barrier. <clears throat> high barrier uh, means uh, P bar is large. Okay, so that means then the integral of this thing from zero to A, when I reach this on the right hand side of P bar of x dx, okay? Uh, if you want a unit this quantity, you can put the one over h bar in front of it, is going to be very large. Okay, all the quantities are here are large. Okay, P bar is large, A is large, so when I integrate that, I'm going to get a large quantity. So exponential of that, okay, so exponential one over h bar zero a p bar of x dx is very large. Okay, so uh, this term here, which I am, I have inside, okay, the two edges. <coughs> when I multiply that by c to see what happens on the other side of the barrier, this corresponds to an extremely large value. But after all that calculation, I am going to end up with a right-hand side here, E, which is very small, right? We just <coughs> discussed that this is going to be small. So the only way I can get something like that is if the C is very, very small. Okay, so uh, this is possible if C is, okay, very small. Uh, in fact, I'll approximate it as zero, okay? All right, so I just don't have that term. I have here something which is very small because now it's e to the minus a large number. So this is a small number when, I, when x becomes a, when it reaches the other side. But that's okay because I want, okay, small number on the right hand side anyway, okay? So if I now solve this problem, okay, remember how we solve these problems, we match boundary conditions, etc., And then we get everything in terms of a, right? A is the input to the problem. We solve B and D and E, everything will fall out in terms of the variable A. So the ratio of, for example, A to B, okay, gives us, okay, the reflection and E to A uh, gives us transmission and such things, okay? So it's the ratios between A and those numbers which are going to give me uh, various results. Okay, so let's just uh, then uh, see how this is going to proceed. Let me try to squeeze the rest of the argument over here. Uh, we know that D is somehow going to be proportional to A, okay? So D is going to be uh, proportional to A, everything, all, all of these coefficients will be proportional to A, okay? <coughs> okay, we have a B in the classroom trying to learn quantum mechanics, but 
It's <laughs> okay, as long as it doesn't sting me, we are okay. <laughs> okay, so we know that D is proportional to A, but then E, okay, is going to be proportional to, okay, this D times this huge, okay, uh, Okay, this is the small, okay, prefactor. So, let's see. Uh, e is going to be proportional to uh, D times this E to the minus, let's call it gamma, okay, where gamma is that integral, okay, so this object I'm going to call gamma. Okay, so d times e to the minus gamma, I have this square root of p in the uh, beginning. I, I could even put that in, but okay, I, this is just an order of uh, magnitude type of argument. So e is proportional to that. So in some sense, uh, e is proportional to, okay, one over root p bar uh, times a, okay? So in terms of uh, the size, in terms of the scale. All right, so the transmission coefficient is going to be proportional to, okay, some, uh, so I, I should be consistent with my notation, right? Like this, I mean proportional to. Okay, so T is proportional to uh, just E over A, magnitude squared. So you can see that it will behave like E to the minus two gamma. Okay, so it's going to behave, so the result of all this discussion is that the transmission coefficient depends quite sensitively on the thickness of the barrier and on the height of the barrier. So <clears throat> depending on the thickness and the height, you can get very large changes in the amount of transmission through this barrier, okay? So I remember earlier discussing with you things like uh, electron tunneling microscope. So if you make a tunneling barrier whose width depends on, for example, whether a, there's a atom at some place or not. So let me perhaps just draw that as a picture here. Okay, so suppose you have a uh, crystal structure or any solid of some sort with some nice regular atoms. And then you construct a needle, okay, a conductive object made up of certain atoms. You may not be able to have much control over this because this is going to, okay, uh, be made by breaking a wire or something and you don't know where this last atom is, but as long as it is farther away from all of the others, okay, you have now here a barrier, okay, for the electrons. So electrons are either on this conductor, which has a lower potential, or they are on this conductor, which also has a lower potential. And in between, there's a barrier. So this, the width of the barrier is A, and its height is related to <coughs> the work function of these uh, conducting objects. So it sort of looks something like this. Okay, so you have the, uh, as you move this thing along in this direction, Okay, you are going to get some tunneling current from this tip, okay, as it moves over here, there's going to be tunneling over there. So it's very, it's very selective to the distance 
between these two conductors. So by measuring this current, you can have a measurement of the gap between the two conductors, which then gives you this shape, okay? What, what the geometry of this shape is as you move this tip along that surface, okay? So this is called scanning uh, tunneling microscopy and is quite a useful tool because you can look at surfaces at atomic resolution, okay? Uh, there is a, another uh, example in your uh, textbook about uh, alpha decay. Uh, I am not going to uh, discuss the example here uh, again, uh, but uh, I suggest that you read through the algebra. I'll just discuss physically what it is. Uh, alpha decay is the decay of a... Uh, nucleus, which, okay, so you have some nucleus here, and every once in a while, okay, so it's one of those heavier nuclei, something like uranium or whatever, and every, every once in a while, you have an alpha particle uh, coming out. Okay, alpha particle is a helium nucleus, so it has two protons and a number of uh, neutrons, probably three, I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> it just throws out these things every once in a while. So how fast this is emitted depends obviously on the nucleus. And for some nuclei, this is quite fast. Okay, in the uh, in fractions of a second. For other nuclei, it is extremely long lifetimes, may take years, okay? But <clears throat> what is happening here? So physically, <coughs> excuse me, what is the physical process that is responsible for this decay? Now, a model for it is that you have this nucleus and where this nucleus is, you have some attractive force between <coughs> these nuclei. Okay, otherwise they wouldn't stay together, right? They are all positive. So as a function of this radial distance from the center, you have a low energy state, okay, low energy region for the potential where the alpha particle normally resides. But if it ventures to get outside some radius, okay, so this is the radius of the nucleus. If it gets out of it, then, then you have a very strong positive charge here. Positive charge is there. It's a, there's a very repulsive potential, okay, Coulomb potential, which goes to zero. Okay, so you have some potential like this, and since the end result is that you have this particle going out with some finite energy, okay, you model this as a particle with some energy over here, E, okay, which is trapped inside this potential. Okay, so this alpha particle is trapped inside this nucleus. It has some energy which is higher than the energy of the vacuum outside. So it does not, this does not really correspond to a stationary state. But since this barrier is so high, you do not have, okay, a quick release of energy and the particle just cannot go out very easily. Okay, so it's a tunneling process. Okay, the particle is over here at this energy and it has to go through this barrier okay, to release itself. And you can use WKB approximation to find out the rate at which this event will happen, okay, the tunneling probability, and 
you can look at your textbook for the very amazing and beautiful plots that you get as a function of energy depending on different nuclei and everything. So it works, the model works extremely well. Okay, so this was a puzzle for a very long time because people could not understand when you have this potential which you can actually experimentally detect very well. You can just scatter particles of this thing. So you just shoot particles and because of the strong Coulomb force, the charged particles that you send towards this nucleus are scattered off. So you can see this potential rising. But every once in a while, there's this particle coming out, okay, waving its hands very slowly, okay? It doesn't seem to have come from the top, okay? So it was amazing that you have these lower energy particles that are coming out of this hill, okay? It's relatively small energy compared to the uh, to the uh, peak values that you can have there. Okay, so please look at your book. It involves this integral. You see in WKB, as you are finding out also in your homework, uh, the uh, trick is to be able to do this integral for various types of functions. Uh, otherwise, of course, it's not so uh, useful if you cannot do the integral. Uh, you could do it numerically, of course, but that's another matter. Okay, any questions? Okay, now let's uh, move on to the case when E becomes comparable to V. Okay, so let me move this board to the top, but I'm just going to keep this here. Okay, but let's do our work over here. Now, <clears throat> okay. So the question is, what happens when V is approximately equal to E? Okay. Now, you see, in this case, so let's, let me just draw that again. So here I have my x, this is my v of x, and here is my v of x going out something like that, and that's the energy of the particle, and I'm interested in solving problems like this. So over here, farther away, to the left and to the right, I am okay, but what happens when <coughs> this V becomes comparable to E? Now obviously we discussed that we cannot solve this because I have this singularity occurring in the coefficient. Uh, <coughs> so we are going to do the following. It will sound complicated, but you are going to be, the end result is extremely simple. Okay, so suppose I have this point x0 at which E becomes comparable to V. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that again, this is with V is a relatively smooth curve, so it can be, exper it can be approximated as a straight line, okay? So I'll assume that it's a straight line going from this point to that point. So over here, when I'm sufficiently away from the energy, I have the solution. So somewhere over here, okay, WKB works. Okay, and over here, some region over here, again, WKB works. And it's the region in the center that's prob problematic. So what I'll do is I'm going to assume that this is a straight line going through like this. Okay, so this is assume linear, okay, dependence. 
So if I have a linear dependence like this, okay, it turns out that I can solve the Schrodinger equation in that region exactly. Okay? It's a complicated, okay, ugly special function. Okay, no mathematicians here, right? But some of them would find it beautiful, but okay. Uh, they are called the airy functions. And then what I will do is I'll look at the asymptotic form of the airy function and fit it to the WKB function over here. And I'll look at the airy function and look at its, again, asymptotic form and fit it to the WKB function over there. So that means I will be fitting this WKB function to that one with an exact solution in between. Exact in the sense that I'm assuming that this is linear. It doesn't have to be linear, of course. But at least it takes care of this region in the center. So it looks complicated, right? I have to work with this area functions and th this and that. But the end result is extremely simple, OK? So I'll just describe what's happening here very briefly, but then we'll just go to the end result. OK? Any questions? <clears throat> yes? Why are we interested in the right at the transition point? What's the uh, OK, what we are trying to do, really, is we are trying to match the solution here, which we hope is sort of accurate anyway. And we have the solution over here, which is, again, which we can treat quite accurately. But we do not know what's going on over here. OK? So we just take this region. OK, well, you can find another approximation if you like, but this is something which works so well anyway that it's commonly used. Okay, so let me just uh, tell you what we are going to do. Uh, we'll assume that the potential in this region is, okay, V of x is approximately equal to E uh, plus some constant x minus x0, right? So we'll assume it's linear like this. So in that region, I'm going to get minus h bar squared over 2m d squared dx squared of the wave function <coughs> plus e plus alpha x minus x0 u is equal to e u. OK, so I am assuming something of this form. The first thing you see is that these e terms cancel. And I can write this equation as d squared dx squared u uh, minus 2m alpha over h bar squared x minus x0 u is equal to 0. Uh, this is OK. I guess that's OK. Uh, OK. Now, the next thing we do is we make a transformation uh, such that we call uh, x minus x0 times, OK, I have to be careful. There's an x there, x there. So. Uh, Let's see, 2m alpha or h bar squared, I think, to the one third power, let's see, is equal to a new variable, z. OK, I have to be, I have to also look at what's happening here. So this tells me that uh, 2m alpha over h bar squared, 1 over 3 dx is equal to dz. So let's now put all of these things in. Uh, 
you see I am going to get d squared d z squared, right? Uh, so which way does that go? dx, uh, so in place of dx I have to put this thing to the uh, minus a third, so it's going to be 2m alpha over h bar squared 2 over 3 times dz squared u minus, I still have that, 2m alpha over h bar squared uh, and then I have, let's see, uh, if I convert that to z, so this is going to be 2 over 3 uh, z u is equal to 0, so that these things cancel, and I get an equation d squared d z squared u is equal to z times u. Okay, so this differential equation is called uh, the Airy equation, uh, and it's the solution. The solution is through the solution to a Schrödinger equation, which has a linear potential. So, what does the solution look like? Let's just look at that. Okay, so the solution, if I now look at the solution as a function of z, okay, so the solution are called the ai of z and bi of z. <coughs> so at z equal to zero, which corresponds to x equal to x zero, you have a change in the nature of the solution. Here you have to the right, Okay, you are going to get an energy which is below the potential. So these things, remember, correspond to exponentially decaying functions. So to the right, I'm going to get exponentially decaying functions, but to the left, I'm going to get oscillating functions. Okay, so this airy function is something which we are nicely decays to zero like this, but to the left it's something that's just oscillating faster and faster because its kinetic energy becomes larger and larger, so I'm not doing justice to this figure, but okay, it's something that's doing something like that. Okay, so to the <laughs> right it is going to do something exponential, to the left, okay, it's going to be sinusoidal. <coughs> Since the second degree equation, it has another solution. And as you can <coughs> sort of guess, that is going to, okay, uh, diverge as you go <coughs> to plus C. And towards minus C, again, it's going to be an oscillating function. Okay, so qualitatively, this is what it looks like. Let me see if, uh, okay, let me just try to write down the asymptotic forms here. Uh, okay, so over here, AI goes like, okay, e to the minus uh, 2 over 3 z to the 3 over 2. And over here, uh, it goes like e to the plus 2 over 3 z to the 3 over 2. On the uh, AI side, this uh, goes like, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if you go very far away, it goes like sine 
2z uh, to the 3 over 2, uh, 2 over 3, uh, plus pi over 4. These are asymptotic forms, okay? And bi uh, similarly has a cosine of the same thing, cosine uh, 2 over 3z to the 3 over 2 plus pi over 4. Okay, so nasty functions, okay, with nasty limits, but they match very beautifully with the <coughs> WKB approximation. Okay, so it will be, uh, for example, if you want to use uh, a uh, function here, which is going to be oscillatory on the left, but it's going to decay exponentially like that. We use the Airy function over there so that this piece matches the WKV solution to the right, and this one matches the WKV, oscillator WKV solution to the left. Okay, so what do we get? Uh, <coughs> let's see. Maybe it's best to give an early break at this stage. Let's have an hour break, and then in the second hour, I'll start discussing what, how these things go.